very honored to have, uh, I won't say share the stage, I don't think that quite works on Zoom, but as our uh, guest speaker, uh, Ben Dorora has, has done tremendous work and, and uh, I look forward to hearing him as well. My job is to tell you about NGO Monitor for about five minutes, maybe a little bit longer. So I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna whip through some of this information. And uh, if you'll, excuse me, I'll put it on the screen here as a PowerPoint and uh, make a few comments. And obviously this is, uh, we're looking at now in a few minutes, what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And so if there are questions, comments, other things, you're welcome to go look at our website. It's easier to find NGO monitor hyphen in the middle.org and uh, get into it. And please uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, as Hanan said in a very uh, generous way, we're the only organization out there that does this. I, about 20 years ago, there was something called the Durban, the UN Durban Conference on the Elimination, the Complete Elimination of Racism and Discrimination. It was held in Durban, South Africa in September, uh, just before 9-11, 2001. That's really where I discovered the politics, the, the vicious politics, the dangerous politics of non-governmental organizations. That's what an NGO is. How powerful they are in setting agendas. This was run by a number of NGOs, this big conference. That was the beginning of the BDS movement. That was the beginning of this kind of demonization. And I began to do the research and that evolved into the development of NGO Monitor. Where do these organizations get the power from? Where do they get their money from? How do they work? How does anybody oversee what they do? Does they check the, the accuracy of the claims of war, cri war crimes and human rights violations and violation of international law? All of that gets into the media and I began to look at this to see that there was really no, there were no checks and balances. These organizations are run very secretively. They talk about democracy, but they're run very secretively. The picture that you see in the screen is one of a big demonstration at Durban, South Africa, on the, on the occasion of the, uh, the NGO forum. And you can see the signs. This was the, uh, this was the beginning of this, the modern demonization of Israel and uh, we have to cope with that. They're the ones that go to the UN and, and impose a black a blacklist, a BDS blacklist. They're trying to get the International Criminal Court to open up investigations of Israelis, not Syrians and, and not Iraqis and not North Korea, but of Israel on the allegations of war crimes. They don't, they're not transparent. They don't tell you. I had a meeting today with a European ambassador. One of the big issues was their government doesn't publish who they're giving money to. They, we know that we're giving money to dozens of organizations, but their government doesn't publish the details. And that's why we have to do the work. We know that at least $150 million a year are spent by these organizations in order to demonize Israel. And all across the board, Palestinian groups, fringe Israeli groups, European groups, American groups, global groups like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, that's, that's a, a lot of power to influence the, the agenda in the media, in the UN, in the International Criminal Court and elsewhere. What we do primarily is research. Research with the goal of having a direct effect on policy. If we can cut out their budgets, and we've done that pretty successfully over the years, reducing significantly the amount of money that's available every year. If we can get some of the governments to realize that the NGOs are not the source of wisdom and truth on human rights, then we're doing our job. So we call it removing the NGO halo effect. Well, they're human rights organizations. They must be doing good things. To encourage and to push for the establishment of moral standards and guidelines. There are a set of journalistic ethics. They don't always obey them, but in any journal, school of journalism, there are courses on ethics of journalism. There are no ethics or guidelines for it, these powerful NGOs, for groups that call themselves guardians of human rights. We put the information out there. It's called naming and shaming. We show when they're being anti-Semitic or in our recent research that Hanan recently just cited in the introduction on how money that is designated for fighting corona through the United Nations or through the European Union goes for organizations that are affiliated with Palestinian terrorist groups. And as soon as that gets into the newspapers, and we've had a lot of good coverage in Europe on that, that forces the officials to answer. And usually they, just, they say, well, we didn't know. That doesn't make them look good when they're providing lots of money. On that, pro on that basis, we change the discourse, we show the hypocrisy, and we have an impact on a lot of these processes. Some of the, I'll just show you briefly what the, some of the impacts that we have. We've reduced by about 50 million over the last 
less than 10 years, the amount of money that goes to BDS groups. Some of them have been forced to close down. Others have been forced to reduce the number of people, the size of their campaigns. Uh, we're very grateful always when some organization condemns us for having caused this because that means we're doing our job. We, so the, the, reducing the amount of money is important. We are seeing some NGO funding guidelines being adopted by the European Union and, and a number of other countries. Our job is also to make sure they're not just adopted but implemented. We are very active against the NGO lobby, the anti-Israel NGO lobby in the United Nations. And we have caused UN bodies to go more slowly in the adoption of BDS initiatives, in some cases, to delay for a long time because of the points that we make, particularly in the fact that a lot of the, the claims are illegal. A lot of the, uh, the efforts are not based on international law, but on fiction. And very recently, we have forced the European Union, the commissioner for the neighborhood policy, to open an investigation of who the EU is funding in terms of links to Palestinian terrorists all based on the research that we've done and the really very skilled researchers that we have who go through all the details. We have begun to have an impact. I say more than begun, we are having a steady impact through the media. Our articles, our reports are quoted quite frequently in a number of different areas across the board. And that has also created more willingness to look at the, the negative impacts that of the NGO process, the human, that claiming to promote human rights, but actually using it as a means of, of waging political war against Israel, and that's being recognized. So getting into the media is also part of the process. Finally, just to show you that we, we do a lot of traveling, uh, also in Israel, hopefully we'll be back. These are images that we've done this. Uh, in the bottom you say uh, Ilan Carr, who is the uh, U.S. government, the State Department's representative on fighting anti-Semitism. We meet with uh, European ambassadors, foreign ambassadors, not just European, also uh, from the United States and Canada. Our conference, uh, also Natan Sharansky addressed it, we're a, a broad group of people. We appear in the United Nations. We appear on, on television and other multimedia, and even starring in a NGO publication from the, uh, the Swedish government, which accused NGO Monitor and me of being the center of a spider web that is causing the reduction in the very necessary aid for the, uh, for the Palestinians to help them to get their freedom. Of course, what we've done is pointed out that money often goes to terrorism and anti-Semitism. So at least we, we are getting recognition, even in the form of this, the spider web cover on the, uh, the, the Swedish government international aid magazine. I think hopefully that gives you an idea of the kind of work that we do and some of the impacts that we have. And as I said, I'd be happy to uh, have discussions with you to answer any questions that you have to provide more information. And uh, on this note, I will now turn it back over to Hanan to introduce our, our guest. Thank you very much. Uh, wanted to, uh, before I forget, uh, bring to your attention that we have a Q&A button. Uh, at the end of uh, Professor Bendoro's uh, presentation, um, uh, you can ask the questions anytime. Okay, it's, it's a chat fe feature. Uh, it says Q&A at the bottom of the screen, or if you use an iPad, it could be a different area. It says Q&A, click on it, ask the questions. And uh, at the end of the uh, presentation, there will be an opportunity to answer the questions. Um, I'm delighted and honored to introduce uh, uh, Bendoro Yamini. He's a researcher, speaker, and senior journalist uh, with Idiot Achronot, the largest Hebrew daily, which I read. Uh, he's conducted extensive research about anti-Israel propaganda. Uh, his la latest bestseller, Industry of Lies, was published in November 2014 in Hebrew, and then again in English three years later. He lectures frequently at many leading universities and parliaments throughout the world. His articles are published in numerous prominent newspapers and around the world. Uh, uh, he's uh, not just a very well-known Israeli author and journalist. Uh, he's a guy who, uh, a sabra, he's from Tel Aviv. His entire life has been dedicated to uh, his journalistic endeavors. Uh, he's uh, highly regarded both as a journalist and a person of knowledge and expertise in the book that he published, Industry of Lies. And we're very, very lucky to have uh, uh, ben Dori Mini today with us. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ben -Dor. Welcome. Thank you very much and uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Hanan. Thank you, uh, Gerald. 
for um, having me here with you. Um, and um, uh, everything is okay? You hear me? Everything is well? Okay. And um, I must tell you, I was, uh, I was giving something like uh, 20 minutes to speak. Uh, and actually I need seven hours, which I guess we don't have, unfortunately. Uh, so I'll do my best. I'll do my best that, uh, you know, uh, uh, to say whatever I want to say in, in uh, uh, the very limited time that I have. So um, let's just begin, because uh, otherwise uh, we will waste uh, more time. And okay, my book is uh, Industry of Lies. It was uh, published in English. And to tell, me, to tell you just a short story, how did I get to, uh, what, uh, to my research about Industry of Lies? For many years, I was uh, what you might call a peace activist. And I went on the way uh, many years ago when I was uh, much younger uh, to uh, meet Yasser Arafat. And you can see us uh, uh, together in Tunis. And it was even before the Oslo Accords. And I still meet the Palestinians. Uh, here I am just last summer with uh, Saeed Barikat, the chief negotiator, as we all know. And uh, as a peace activist, um, I was, of course, exposed to a lot of declarations, a lot of conversations with Palestinians. But it was not what bothered me when I heard lies from them. Uh, what bothered me is that when, in that time, I was, by the way, I was a lawyer, and then I moved to full-time uh, job in uh, journalism. And I do remember myself in 2002, uh, reading an article of Professor Ilan Pape, maybe some of you heard about him. Uh, he, in that time, was an Israeli professor in Haifa University. And I read the article claiming that transfer is official moral option recommended by the IDC. IDC is an academic institution in Israel, and that uh, transfer was pos pos posed by senior Labour Party. Uh, and uh, that very few dare to speak against the transfer. Transfer, to those of you who do not understand, it means to conduct a new Nakba to the Palestinians, a new catastrophe to uh, force people out of Israel, of Palestine. I read the article, full of lies, full of lies. And uh, I called him immediately, now as a journalist, and I told him, dear Professor Pape, somebody published an article on your behalf full of lies, why don't you call them and remove your name? And surprise, surprise, he told me, no, I wrote the article. It's not a mistake. Can you validate something? I asked him, and it was quite embarrassing for 20 minutes of conversation. Uh, he could not. He could not. And at the end of the conversation, I told him, look, tomorrow I'm going to publish an article. I will not call you a liar because it's not nice but I'm going to call you a mega liar. And I hope you will take me to court. I published the article, he never took me the court. By a coincidence, the day after, the day after, the very same week, I read another article of another uh, scholar, he's writing regularly for Haaretz newspaper. And according to him, gas chambers are not the only way to destroy a nation. It's enough to develop high rates of infant mortality. I read the article that was published in a very prestigious magazine in, uh, in Britain, London Review of Books. And uh, this time I did not call him, but I checked. I mean, this is what we are doing to the Palestinians? Unbelievable. We are behaving like the Nazis, but in a very sophisticated way. And uh, it was not easy in that time because we did not have yet uh, this uh, Google search in 2002. But I found that actually infant mortality among Palestinians decreased dramatically, just the opposite of what he published, which means that what he published, an Israeli, a Jew, a scholar teaching in Tel Aviv University, what he published was a new blood libel against Israel. And it went on and on. I'm not going to show you everything because uh, of our uh, very limited uh, time. Uh, sorry that I... Uh, and uh, for example, a uh, uh, professor from Columbia University published an article saying, true facts, uh, the title was, 
true facts and facts on the ground. Wow, now you are going to hear only the truth about Israel. According to him in that article, Tel Aviv is the only Western city that does not have any Arab or Muslim inhabitants. Wow, I guess most of you know Tel Aviv. My doctor in Tel Aviv, by the way, lives in Tel Aviv. A Muslim is uh, uh, an Israeli Arab. And uh, he kept on, uh, and he wrote in that article that Netanyahu called to expel the 1.6 million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. Well, I have no idea what you think about Netanyahu, and we are not speaking about politics here. But the only one sentence that Netanyahu said in that particular event that uh, uh, Mossad uh, wrote about, the only one sentence was, was that the Jewish state of Israel will always protect the rights of all the more than one million Arab citizens. Just the opposite. And I, I have to admit that I began to understand that something is happening here, something very strange. And um, it kept on. It kept on. When I read an article of Professor Juan Cole from uh, Michigan University, in that time he was the president of MESA. MESA is Middle East Studies Association. And he wrote in his article that according to the official 9-11 uh, commission report, Al-Qaeda conceived the attack as response to the Israeli attack on Jenin. I went to the report. It's public, each one of you can read it. Uh, and surprise, surprise, I did not find the word Janin in the report. Now, to make it even worse, let me tell you, the battle in Janin was in the year after the 9-11. It was in 2002. He completely lied, blatant lie. By the way, I'm checking from time to time if he, uh, uh, maybe we'll remove it. He did, he, he never did. You can still find it in uh, this uh, uh, article in his website. And it's going on and on and on, but we don't have time. Just some words um, that lately I speak about, in the last two, three years, I speak a lot about. I will make it short because we don't have time. Uh, mainly in the United States. Because in the United States, uh, when I speak with young students uh, in Hillel clubs and uh, other places, they are not anti-Israelis, they are not anti-Semites, many of them are Jews, of course, and they do not understand the whole idea of a nation state. Why do you need a Jewish state? Is a question that they ask again and again, repeatedly. And um, I'll give you the short explanation because we don't have time. I will not go to all the details. But in short, let's remember that when we are speaking about uh, when Zionism began at the end of the 19th century, most of the world was controlled by empires, non-nation states. And then many peoples began to fight for independence, for freedom, for liberation. Zionism was part of it. Other peoples felt that they are persecuted by the rulers, by empires. Jews felt that they are persecuted much more than any other uh, group of people, more than any other community. That's why Zionism began. The whole idea of nation state was anti-colonial and anti-imperialist. Zionism was part of it. And you cannot understand later on uh, I skip, I skip, I skip because we don't have time. You cannot understand the Balfour Declaration without understanding the whole idea of self-determination. The whole story that the uh, uh, League of Nations gave Britain the mandate to uh, rule Palestine, it was as part of liberating peoples from imperialist powers. And when people say that Zionism is part of colonialism and imperialism, they do not understand the background. It was not only the Balfour Declaration, because before the Balfour Declaration, there was the Declaration of uh, 
the French uh, foreign ministry uh, saying that Jews should have their uh, uh, national homeland. Uh, there was the 14 points of uh, Woodrow Wilson at the end of the First World War. But without understanding the background, we cannot understand the whole idea of Zionism and of a Jewish state. It was, the whole story was, as I said, anti-colonial and anti-imperialist and so many students out there, mainly in, in uh, the US, they do not understand that self-determination is by its nature anti-imperialist. And it's going on and on and on. We don't have time to go uh, through uh, all of it. I'm so sorry. League of Nations, of course, decided upon in two, uh, to 1922 uh, about uh, uh, the adopting of the Palfour Declaration, and it went on and on. Uh, Palestine was, uh, that was the, the, what you see in, in this map, uh, is what was allocated uh, for Palestine immediately after there was the first partition. Transjordan was created uh, by Britain, uh, and it went on. Uh, I'm skipping, uh, I'm going to uh, 1937. The Peel Commission uh, plan was that, that Israel will receive what you see here in yellow. Surprise, surprise, even if it was something like 4%, 4% from the original Palestine, it was accepted by the Jewish leadership. It was rejected by all the Arabs. I'm not saying Palestinians because in that time, there was not any Palestinians. Actually, there were. The Jews in that time, people do not understand it many times. Jews were the Palestinians. My parents who grew up in Palestine, they were called Palestinians. Every Jewish institution in that time was called Palestinian something. A Palestine Post is the Jerusalem Post of today. Palestine Bank is the National Bank of Israel today. But people do not understand it. The definition as Palestinians was adopted much later, actually uh, at the end after the 67 war, but before that, they were Arabs who lived in Palestine. Anyway, the Peel partition plan was uh, rejected by all the Arab uh, world. Later on, needless to say, 10 years uh, after, the very known partition plan of the UN, and you can see here on the map what was uh, uh, the plan, what was offered to uh, the Jews, what was offered to the Arabs. Now, in the partition resolution, you can find 29 times the definition Jewish state, 29 times. But you will not find a, a Palestinian state. You will find an Arab state. Because as I told you, there was not any Palestinian people. It, became, it came uh, much later. And uh, it went on and on and on. Now, in order to understand what happened in 48 and in the Nakba, the story of the transfer, in order to understand, we have to uh, remember that again, the partition plan was accepted by the Jewish leadership. It was totally rejected by all the Arab delegates. And the leader was the Mufti Haj Amin al Husseini, who was the leader of the Arabs uh, in Palestine. And before the war began, the Secretary General of the Arab League declared this will be a war of extermination and momentous, uh, and, and momentous massacre. It went on. Many Arab leaders in that time declared, we are going to throw you uh, to the sea. And there was the invasion. And Israel was supposed, according to the reports of the British intelligence and the American intelligence, the Jewish not even born state was supposed to be defeated in few days or in few weeks. People do not understand the reality of the time. 
And, uh, and David Ben-Gurion decided to take the risk and to declare a state, a Jewish state. The day after uh, five Arab armies uh, invaded and they had a lot of success uh, and they uh, conquered a lot of uh, territories, eventually, eventually we know the result. Israel was not uh, exterminated, Israel was not defeated. And the problem that was created in that time, of course, was that during the war, something like 700,000 of Arabs, not Palestinians, Arabs, escaped, fled, or were forced out. Yes, some of them were forced out. Now it's called Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe. And uh, Professor uh, John Mirsheimer, one of the leading professors in the United States, one of the authors of the uh, book about the Israeli lobby, he uh, declared that the Nakba is one of the great crimes of modern history. It's very interesting to uh, see how professors brainwash their students. Why I'm saying that it's a kind of a brainwash? I'm saying it because when we go on and check what happened in many other places, population exchange and transfer was the norm in that time, beginning with, uh, I mean, it, it began much uh, earlier, but because of the collapse of empires and because of uh, uh, the creating of nation states, a huge wave of population exchange took place. People were transferred. Speaking about Turkey and Greece, we are speaking about almost 2 million people. Uh, speaking about Balkans, only about uh, the Balkans, we are speaking about, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, speaking about the uh, uh, Balkans, something went wrong with the presentation, but anyway, only in the Balkans we are speaking about something like 7 million people who were forced out. Uh, uh, speaking about ethnic Germans, uh, 12 million were forced out after the Second World War. Poland, Ukraine, uh, we are speaking about uh, uh, 1.4 million people who were forced out. But it's not only that, it's much more than that. Because in that time, it was the norm. It was a standard. Nobody th thought in that time that it's a crime against humanity. For example, this person that you see here, Friedrich of Nansen, he received the Nobel Prize for Peace because he initiated and conducted the population exchange in the Balkans. It went on, even the Permanent Court of International Justice in that time uh, declared that population exchange in the Balkans is the best way in order to achieve peace. It went on. Musa Alami, one of the leaders of the Arabs in Palestine, declared that it will be the solution eventually. And he did not, of course, uh, uh, accept the idea of a Jewish state, but uh, even an independent canton for the Jews will be without Arabs. And it went on, the Peel Commission that I spoke about recommended upon population exchange between Jews and Arabs. And it went on and on with uh, more and more Arab, Arab leaders. We have to bear it in mind. And, uh, and uh, I'm skipping because we don't have time. Labour Party uh, in Britain in uh, 1944 declared that this will be the solution, transfer of populations. Winston Churchill, the leader of the three world, declared at the end of the Second World War, expulsion is a math method which will be the most satisfactory and so on. Now, I have to emphasize, I'm not saying that it's good today. It's not my political view. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in that time, it was the norm. And by ignoring the realities and the norms of that time, people like Mirshamir, like others, like all the NGOs of the BDS can declare again and again that Israel committed in 48 a crime against humanity. It's a lie. It's a lie. It must be clear. And only in Europe, by the way, between 44 and 51, 20 million people were 
forced out of their homelands. And we have also to bear in mind that uh, the Mufti, the leader of the Arabs in Palestine, uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini, he wrote in his memoirs that their aim in uh, cooperating with, the, with Germany, with the Nazis, with Hitler, was to eradicate every last Jew from Palestine and from the Arab world. And uh, the Arab League decided upon that Jews from Arab countries are going to pay the price. And a lot of massacres took place against Jews. There is a problem with the uh, presentation, so they cannot, uh, you cannot see all uh, of the uh, massacres that I'm talking about. Eventually, the result was that, uh, that yes, 711,000 Arabs became refugees. Most of them fled. Some of them were forced out. And a bigger number of Jews were forced out or escaped or were forced to escape from the Arab countries. The Jewish Nakba, totally forgotten. The property that they left behind that was confiscated by the Arab uh, uh, states was of a much higher value. And when they came to Israel, by the way, in the 50s, they lived in uh, refugee camps that was, were called Ma'abarot, which means uh, transit camps. But it was uh, just like refugee camps. Altogether, speaking about that time, we are speaking about almost 60 million people that became refugees. How many of them are refugees today? Let me tell you. Zero. Except one group. Only one, which is the Palestinians. They emerged to 5.5 million people, according to UNRWA. Other people are saying even, uh, uh, are giving even uh, higher uh, numbers. It also happened because the UN, the, uh, UN decided to uh, establish two agencies. One, one is the UNHCR, which is taking care of all the refugees in the world. And the other one is UNRWA, which was dedicated only for the Palestinians. The UNRWA was established five days after the UNHCR. Why? Because of political uh, reasons. Why? Because the Arabs did not want to solve the problem. They wanted to perpetuate the problem. I'm skipping, skipping, skipping. I'm just uh, getting back for a minute to Professor uh, uh, Mirsheimer, it is uh, to remind you, he said that the Nakba is one of the great crimes of modern history. Wow. He published an article in the New York Times saying about the Yugoslavia war in the 90s. He published the article in 93. Ethnically homogeneous state must be created. It would require transferring populations. Wow. What a hypocrite. I asked him, how come that you defined what happened in 48 as one of the great crimes, and now you yourself, when it's not the norm anymore, it's not the standard, now it is considered to be a crime against humanity, how come that you recommend it? Well, as he answered to you, he answered to me. And we can go on and on and on and on. I'm skipping because we don't have uh, time. Just some words about, you know, occupation, 67, uh, uh, 67 uh, uh, war, just to tell you, people are saying Israel is an imper imperialist power and so on. The Arab League, the uh, Arab leaders, one by one, declared before the war began about extermination. There was not any occupation. But they declared, we are coming to destroy, to exterminate the Jewish state, to wipe Israel off the map. And, uh, and uh, the leader of the uh, Palestinians in that time, before the one who was the leader before uh, Yasser Arafat, he declared three days, three days before the war began, whoever survives after the war will stay in Palestine among the Jews. How nice of him, how nice. But in my opinion, he declared, no one will remain alive. I remember myself as, as a kid digging in uh, uh, the sand in order to have a kind of shelter because we did not have any uh, basements or something in that time. People do not understand the reality. And then you hear people 
claims that Israel was the imperialist power. Oh, we have to apologize for not being exterminated, for not being defeated. And uh, again and again, I'm, I'm skipping, I'm skipping, I'm skipping because we don't, uh, we, we don't okay, have we'll... time. Just, I guess I don't have a lot of time. Yes, we have Hannah, some time for questions. Yes, uh, we have some questions. I'll actually uh, read them to you. Uh, first question from Stefan Kranzdorf. Uh, what yes. is George Soros' weight in the worldwide anti-Semitic propaganda? How much does he direct? Uh, how much is direct and how much is indirect by influencing uh, governments? You know, what's his role in this whole story? I guess, I guess Gerald uh, can answer much better uh, uh, than I can do. I'll do it very, very brief. George, we did a big study on George Soros. He once said that he didn't know where his money was going. So we told him we wrote a major report. We've updated it. Hasn't really affected what he's done. Soros does provide a lot of money for Ben Jor's industry of lies. There's no question about it. If you look at a number of the organizations he funds, you see all the things that uh, Ben Jor has been pointing to there. They reinforce it. They make it look slick and modern, not black and white pictures, but but it's the same same basic messages. But he's one one piece of a much bigger picture, and uh, I think we need to focus. It's easier to focus the the um, concern to the European governments who are giving money to the same organizations. If they stop, then maybe we can uh, get Soros and and some of the other foundations also to do the right thing. But it's it's an uphill battle. Uh, thank you. A question from Judith Hershon. Uh, what role do you assign to Islam in the industry of light? It's for both speakers, obviously. No, uh, my research is not about Islam. My research is not about the propaganda which is taking place in the Arab world. My research and my book, Industry of Lies, is dealing with the Western media, the Western media, and the Western uh, academia. I'm not dealing with the Arab propaganda, but I mean, because I don't have any expectations from uh, the Arab world to be nice to Israel. I'm speaking about uh, the US, about France, about uh, which, I mean, there's so many lies. I, and what I presented was not even 2% from uh, what uh, I wanted to present about the so many lies. Uh, but yes, if you will give me two minutes only to the last and highly important lie, you will give me. Yes, I knew that you will. I had the feeling. Anyway, I'm skipping, skipping, just in order to get to... Uh... Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, no, no, no. I'm skipping even the peace process and so on and so on. Just, uh, you know, when so many times when people uh, uh, criticize Israel, it's not because they are anti-Semites and because, you know, some of the, the it looks like it, they are friends of Israel, but they have a problem with, uh, mainly with the two last operations in uh, Gaza Strip, Kastid operation and, and protective age operation. What they are saying is that Israel has the right to defend itself, but Israel is uh, retaliating in a very disproportionate way. And I think that the highlight uh, of it is the Goldstone report that most of you heard about. Uh, and, and 600 pages that you did not read, I guess maybe, uh, maybe Gerald did. But to summarize it to one sentence is to say that Israel intentionally killed innocent civilians. Wow. I corresponded with him in that time. And I was, needless to say, quite, uh, quite disappointed. And immediately after he published his report, he was interviewed again and again. And he was asked the same question. And the question was, well, uh, you know, innocent civilians are killed in every battlefield. How come that you blame Israel? Half a minute each video, and you will hear the answer, which is highly important. You have to enable your uh, thing to play with the video. Uh, you do not hear? No, there's a, there's a setting that allows you to share your video. Okay, I will skip it. I will just tell you what he said. When he was asked by, uh, he was asked by uh, an Israeli uh, journalist, he said, uh, and he was asked about the U.S. Army, he said, I have not investigated the U.S. Army. Three days later, he was uh, asked the same question by Bill Moyers from uh, the PBS. And he had a new answer. 
and uh, according to him, the U.S. Army has gone to extremes to protect innocent civilians. It's very interesting because when uh, when Martin Dempsey, uh, Martin uh, Dempsey, who was uh, the uh, chief, uh, the chairman of the Joint uh, Chief Staff, when he was asked the same question, he said that he sends his officers to Israel because Israel is protecting innocent civilians much better than any other army. So we have to, but I did something else. I'm skipping, skipping just in order to, uh, I took the age distribution in Gaza Strip. Now, if Goldstone was right, the age distribution of the victims should have been almost the same because it was in indiscriminate fire. What I found out is what you see here. I checked according to the Hamas publications, age and gender. And you can see in first sight that actually most of the victims are men, not women, in the fighting age. It totally contradicts all what uh, uh, Goldson said. And the last one, I checked also all the battlefields that he mentioned, Goldson himself. How many combatants and how many non-combatants were killed in every battlefield? And I'm going to the last uh, uh, graph. What I found out that actually Israel killed much less, not only absolutely, but also proportionally. And I sent one more email to Goldstone and I told him, dear Goldstone, here are the numbers. The outcome is that Israel is killing not, that, that yes, the US Army, I, I, that's what I wrote. The US Army went to extremes in order to uh, protect innocent civilians. But if that's what the U.S. Army did, the meaning is that the Israeli army went to the extremes of the extremes of the extremes in order to protect innocent civilians. As I expected, it was the first time that he did not answer me. Eventually, uh, he himself published an article in the Washington Post saying, if I had known then what I know now, the Goldstone report would have been a different report. I Thank finish you. here just to say. I have a few more questions. Yeah. Okay, Go I'm willing to. Go ahead, Ben Dora. Okay, um, there was a question uh, related to uh, the role of the UN uh, and how the role of the UN has really made this issue a much bigger issue in terms of the whole uh, uh, refugee issue. And that, that how does that impact the whole narrative of, of the industry of light? What I, I, did not, I, did, I did not understand the first what, part of the question. Okay. The, the question was, what role does the UN plays, plays the United Nations plays in, in, in promoting the industry of lies, historically and currently? Uh, all the UN bodies uh, are actually ruled by a majority of dark regimes. I mean, Sudan and Libya and Iran and so on. I mean, you, you, you see it in the UN General Assembly, you see, you see it in the uh, UN uh, Security Council, you see it mainly in the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, they uh, they, uh, they uh, pass much more resolutions against Israel uh, than to the whole states all together combined. So they have a very negative, the international community act, uh, actually has a very negative rule. Uh, they are just uh, empowering, unfortunately, the, the Arab uh, rejectionism, and uh, they do not lead us not to peace and not to reconciliation, unfortunately. But if I can add just a quick point on that, the NGOs, all these organizations, we go to meetings of the UN Human Rights Council, you see Human Rights Watch in there, they have a permanent office in Geneva. They're always, they're writing the resolutions, they're lobbying the delegates, they're issuing their reports, their lies and spreading them around. Amnesty International, they're all out there. And they wrote the Goldstone Report, and that's a very important aspect. Goldstone was basically, I'll use the word carefully, but he was very naive. And I met with him just before he wrote that uh, article that was in the Washington Post. Uh, we had a, a long back and forth, and I went over some of the details with him from a different perspective than Ben Dror did, and showed him how the NGOs had basically pulled, pulled him along one piece, and he, didn't, he trusted them. So the whole report is cita citation after citation, Human Rights Watch said this, that Selim said that, al Haq, a Palestinian organization said they did, Israel did that. There's absolutely no substance behind it. And, and when he finally realized that, 
that's when he recognized that his basically it ruined his life because after yeah. that he was unable even, to even as we know even personally they ruined his life yes yeah yeah last last question uh do you think uh the israeli society and israeli themselves play a role in this industry of lies and what role do they play or what can they play to undo the industry of lies yes the answer the answer is completely yes totally yes i'll tell you why because uh because israelis are uh, one of the main source to uh, uh the industry of lies unfortunately uh, uh Israeli professors, Israeli academics, Israeli uh, uh, scholars and journalists uh, are the main source. And, and you know, and many NGOs. And NGOs, of course, and activists. Yeah, of course, they are. Uh, and, and many times when I'm, when I'm challenged with what uh, uh, some journalist and the uh, Israeli professor said, said, thank you for asking the question because it's the best proof only to one thing, not to what they claim. It's the best proof that Israel is a democracy everything is allowed. Yes, we are paying the price for being a democracy, but it does not mean that what uh, some professors like Ilan Pape, like others publish, is correct. It's not. And of course, I can refute, but uh, that's the second part of the answer. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn the meeting over right now uh, to Dovi or Dan, and then we'll have a few more uh, minutes. You'll be able to email the rest of your questions right to, uh, to our team. And this, record, this entire session was recorded and will be available to watch after. Is that correct, Dov? Yeah. That's correct. Go ahead, Dov. Thank Turning it to, to, to everyone. Th thank you for joining us today. My name is Dov Yarden. I'm the CEO of NGO Monitor. And firstly, I would like to extend our thanks and gratitude to our host, Hanan Liss, for uh, helping put all of this together. Also, thank you to our expert presenters, Ben Droyamini and Professor Gerald Steinberg, NGO Monitor's founder and president. NGO Monitor is a registered non-governmental non organization itself, but unlike uh, those that you may have heard something about today, let me state for the record that NGO Monitor does, does not receive any government funding, not from Israel or from any other government. Our support comes only from private individuals and foundations who care about our work. We are lean, results-driven, with a small staff and low budget. Yet we have many uh, notable uh, initiatives and achievements. Of We've been actively exposing politicized NGOs with direct and demonstrable ties to terror groups. We have succeeded in reducing over $50 million to NGOs promoting BDS, anti-Semitism, hatred, and or have ties to terror. In the past couple of years, due largely to our work, Many countries have passed NGO funding guidelines to ensure no funding to terror, BDS, or anti-Semitism. And these include the European Union, Switzerland, Denmark, Netherlands, and Germany. We're also busy calling out, naming, and shaming NGOs that have published absurd claims and even blood libels against Israel, openly blaming Israel for the COVID-19 crisis. We've been part of a successful international effort to convince governments to implement the IRA definition of anti-Semitism regarding NGO funding. So far, 24 governments, as well as the uh, EU, have adopted the IRA definition. Our work over the past couple of months has not abated, and our staff has been fully engaged, even th through the direst times of the COVID crisis. And we remain the only organization on the global stage that keeps politicized NGOs accountable challenges the lies with facts and forces governments and others to cut off the funding for BDS and the delegitimization of Israel. To continue our work and to continue to achieve the successes that we have, I'm going to ask you for your help. And instructions on how to make a gift to NGO Monitor may be found on our website. Hanan, thanks again for your support and everything you're doing and your leadership. I hand it back over to you. Well, I want to thank everybody who was with us today. We had uh, almost 100 people, actually more, at one time. Uh, we had a nice turnout. Uh, we will repeat this. We'll do this again. Uh, I'm a, my family and I support NGO Monitor financially. Uh, we, we don't just promote the cause. We promote the outcome. Uh, for a lot of people in the diaspora, especially in the United States, we are very frustrated when there's articles, when public... Uh, personalities, uh, especially uh, politically driven uh, universities or kids go to college, 
and they encounter all those lives on campus, off campus. We encounter it in the media and some of the newspapers that we actually pay subscriptions for. The New York Times is fine. Uh, and frankly, it's very frustrating. And we write letters and we go on Facebook and we, we get very enraged and we really want to change what happens and change minds and change hearts. But it all requires facts. It requires direct knowledge of the issues and we need to expose those who are actually funding those um, uh, who are misusing facts, who are misusing facts to delegitimize Israel to basically claim that Zionism is not legitimate and the indigenous people of Palestine are just the Palestinians. These are not facts. These are things that we face every day and NGO Monitor makes it possible to dispute it on the basis of facts, not just emotions. So without them, we cannot do that. So thank you so much to Ben Mini, for General Steinberg, for Dov Verden, and for NGA Monitor. And I really do ask for everybody's support and thank you all for joining us today. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. You can, okay, signing off. Bye. That's it.